was turning the corner on Westheimer. That was out of the whole weeks and weeks of being Grand Marshal when I was uh, in the Porsche and I turned the corner on Westheimer and you see all those people. There's so many people down the, the route and then when you hit that corner and you see everybody and, and it's that feeling realizing that I was opening the parade and all of these people and being part of that was the best moment ever. I just remember laughing the whole way and having everyone shout out my name and you know I was looking around and people would come running up. Uh, one of the great moments was when Jimmy Carper was stopped. He, he was in the car ahead of me being the co-grand marshal that year and he jumps out and he runs back and kisses me full on the mouth and we just cracked up. It was just so much fun. We've had a lot in this community that have done a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh, did really? Did and most of them have passed through here as Grand Marshals since you and I were. Right. I don't know how many people just set out to be a leader. Um, I think I think everybody has skills and and maybe not energy today, but hopefully energy later. You know, we'd all have time commitments and family commitments and so on that may prevent us from being a leader right this minute. But I think everyone has things they can do that will um, help someone else, and uh, it's often just a just a matter of them recognizing that potential in themselves and then matching up with some opportunity. Either it's already there. I used to tell people they'd complain there wasn't this organization or that. I'd say start one. You know, that's what I did. You know, it's a, it's a great way to uh, meet people, to learn new skills. You know, one of the things I say about Houston is, you know, there's great upward mobility in the movement because unlike, say, San Francisco, there's, there aren't as many of us here. So if there's something you want to do, do it. Start it. Find three other people and do it. The Pride Band celebrated their 25th year this year, Andy, mm -hmm. and you started that too. Right. We were... There were two bands at the March on Washington in 79, L.A. and Houston. Early in March of 1988, a friend of mine called and said, you know, there's this really weird radio program on late at night. You really should listen to it. So I listened to it. It's called After Hours. Uh, Buddy Johnston, Buddy Johnston uh, was the producer. I listened, and I was just fascinated. There was our community out there on the airwaves for everybody to hear. I, I came from a place where that didn't happen. I was so fascinated that I went up to the, to the station the next week and I never left. In 1979, the Lesbian Gay Rights Lobby of Texas hired me to do the lobbying at the Texas Legislature. The reason for that was because in 1977, there had been a rider placed in the appropriations bill that allowed state-operated and uh, supported colleges and universities to disallow the use of campus facilities to homosexual and other subversive organizations. So the Lesbian Gay Rights Lobby hired me to get that out of the appropriations bill. 
and I did. When I moved here to Houston, I got real involved in the in the women's community. So my activism goes back to many, many years, women's community, then the uh, lesbian gay community, the mainstream community, then I went to the Hispanic gay community, and then I went kind of back to the women's community. Now, then I went to the Hispanic mainstream straight community. So I've done a lot of activism, um, all based upon, I guess, who I am. I'm a Latina, I'm a lesbian, and uh, I'm a woman, so all that kind of encompassed my activism in, in all those uh, three areas. There's lots of uh, discrimination, discrimination against women, against Hispanics, and against lesbians and gays. So it, it was all of me, but at different times in my life, I felt that I needed to be in those certain places. As a political activist with GLPC and a spokesperson for the gay and lesbian community, I was generally dealing with police officers and with uh, the judicial system. And Ray and I did a lot of good cop, bad cop work, Ray Hill and I, where he would go yell at the police officers and I'd go in and meet with the chief and, and work something out. Well, as a civic club president, I dealt with the other side of city government, how to get potholes filled and garbage picked up. And when it came time for me to run in 97, I put that package together and I had great support from the gay, lesbian, and transgendered community, great support from the civic clubs, and even uh, an endorsement from the police union. And it was just all the pieces of my life, of those 20 years, the activities I'd been involved in coming together to help me uh, become a city council member. I worked in uh, both of her early campaigns in 91, 95, and then 97. The first two I did uh, media, I helped with the media, did every, because on a campaign you do everything, but I did a lot of media and the publications uh, because I had done that for years. Uh, the gay, gay and lesbian political caucus had done the election newsletters and press releases, and so I was just like the, one of the gay media people. Um, and so I carried that on to her office where I do a lot of media and publications and the website and speeches and committee work as well and all kinds of stuff and constituent work. We all do a little bit of everything, but mine's mainly uh, the journalistic side of, of the office. When gay people call and they need help with a police matter or, or something, you know, I can help them more than other people in our office. Um, plus, they know that we're there and they can call us and they trust us. I think that's a tremendous asset that we didn't have before. Uh, we have a place at the table and we can share it with the community. We represent everyone, but we have a place at the table. We have the power to do things from the inside to help people that we didn't have before. And I'm real proud of my role in that. We have an awful lot of harassment, yes. particularly in marriage, because mm -hmm. we were so vocal. And they'd come after me. A police car would follow me home at 2 o'clock in the morning and arrest me for running a red light of Montrose and Westheimer <laughs> and take me to jail. And I got so tired of it, and then when Lee Brown became police chief and they said they were going to need some representatives from the community, I could have murdered 14 people the day <laughs> after that, and those cops would not have touched me. <laughs> but a whole end to the hassle. In 1968, when we had the, uh, uh, the National Conference, North American Council of Homophile Organizations, a meeting in Chicago, The next to the last day of the conference, I was led to make a statement. There was 268 delegates there, there were six women, and I was one of the women. At any rate, I got up and said, and because we've been arguing and da 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 da, the, 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 uh, the main emphasis of that conference was that so we could be, so we could advertise in the yellow pages, in telephone books, for all these little people out in the boonies that didn't know that there was another gay person in the world. You know, it was that way back in the 60s, still in the 60s. At any rate, I got up and said, until we're portrayed as we are in all the media and elevate ourselves as a black man has out of the Stephanie class into the Sydney Portier class, we will have accomplished nothing. And I've lived long enough to see that we are accomplishing what we are, where we are, in all aspects of our lives. One of the most visible differences or changes uh, in the GLBT scene 
um, has been the increased, uh, I guess you could say, coming together of the very segments of our community. It felt and seemed really divided in 1990 when I came. Women didn't want to do much with men, men didn't want to do much with women, black folk didn't want to do anything with European Americans. Uh, it was just very isolated. Everything was, was you know, segregated, literally. Um, I've seen uh, us all kind of rally behind our transgender sisters and brothers. That, that community has really kind of come to life uh, in the 12 years I've been here and found their place at the GLBT table. Just the fact that we use those letters instead of saying gay and lesbian all the time, uh, GLBT is, has, is, is, is uh, evidence of the fact that we are really conscious of each other. In 95, I, frankly, I was surprised that I was Grand Marshal because I always felt like that the community was too, um, was more conservative than I. And in fact, when I was selected Grand Marshal, I thought, well, I'm just not being enough on the edge. And that's when I changed um, all of our advertisements from Suzanne Anderson Properties, Houston's Lesbian and Gay Community, to Houston's Lesbian, Gay, Bi, and Transgender Community, because I thought, well, the community must have caught up, and that's not fun. I guess what I, I can say about Kindred Spirits is that it was a place that I wanted it to be sort of like a woman's alternative meeting, that everyone was welcomed, whether it was older people, straight people, gay people, men and women together, so that we could support each other and learn about each other. I got interested in a bar one day, uh, just sitting in a bar, really, I was about 24. And I was sitting in there, and uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of uh, uh, Hispanic women in there, and they, uh, you know, we wanted to hear our music, and unfortunately back then, you know, it was, you know, not to offense anybody or anything, but uh, there was not a Hispanic bar, and we wanted to hear, you know, a couple of songs, and they put them on there, and, and they would stay there very long. So, you know, I mean, that that that's what inspired me to to want to open a bar. And it was back in '80, and I, it was a, a place on uh, West Gray that I opened, and it was a, a neighborhood a straight bar, and it took me about a year to turn it into a gay bar. Back when I was first coming out, two men could not dance together in any club, in a straight club. Uh, now I have a number of friends who are um, in their 20s and they go out with all of their straight friends and go out on the Richmond Avenue strip at all the straight clubs and they dance with their boyfriends. Uh, in fact, a lot of them have stopped coming into the Montrose area because they say they have as much fun at the straight clubs and uh, they spend all their time with their friends. And I think that is a huge um, improvement of the acceptance level in this country.